Okay, so thank you everybody to be, to be there and to be present today. So this is the second uh, video conference in, in our series. And uh, today, uh, Gael Recha from uh, the GDR Imabio Steering Committee has uh, gently accepted to, to moderate this session. So Gael, if you want maybe Yes. Thank you, Virginie, for organizing this. So um, indeed, today's session will uh, cover the topic related to the application of fluorescence microscopy in studying the relationship between protein structure, dynamics, and function. And this is the occasion to invite both. Uh, so um, uh, Dusan from the confocal.nl company who will talk about more the technology. And then on the other side, uh, Erwin uh, Peterman uh, from Amsterdam, Netherlands. So uh, he will talk more about the science uh, and the uh, academic and scientific question related to the use of that technique. And maybe we can start right away with uh, Dusan if you are ready, and then we'll have Erwin, and then a, a short section of question and answer in the end. So the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for organizing. Uh, merci beaucoup d'avoir organisé le webinaire. Et aussi merci de m'avoir invité à dire quelques mots de solution de microscopie de Confocalena. Thanks a lot for organizing this and allowing me to say a few words. Um, I'm Dusan popov Celeketic and I'm the product manager uh, in Confocal NL. Um, before working in industry, I spent uh, more than a decade in academia and I'm doing super resolution um, since 2010. Uh, regarding super resolution, uh, much more of an authority is, is the second speaker, that is Erwin uh, Peterman. Erwin Peterman will, will talk after me, and he is the full professor at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, Erwin did his PhD in Amsterdam and at the same university, but then he moved to postdoc uh, in, this, in the States, first in Stanford, uh, and he went to a group of uh, William Murner, who is actually a Nobel laureate in super resolution microscopy. Um, after that, he came back to Amsterdam, went through all the necessary um, academic advances to become a full professor. Uh, this was Vidi, and then it was Vici, and finally he is now he's an ERC uh, uh, grant awardee, and he has a very respectful, very strong, and very eclectic group uh, in Freie Universität Amsterdam, and he will tell more about his specific research. Before we move to that, I want to tell about our position as, as Confocal NL in uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy and in application of fluorescence microscopy in protein biology and in cell biology. So, speaking of research, cell biology or protein biology, uh, one has the options of using a number of techniques to visualize the effect in the cell, but any technique fits within a certain trade-off. Meaning on the left-hand side in the top, you have the highest resolution method that can provide the highest resolution imaging. However, those methods are the same time most phototoxic and killing cells. Uh, if you go to the techniques that uh, use lowest laser powers and the, the most photogentle, like light sheet microscopy, those come with a trade-off of very low resolution. In the blue here, in this graph, you see the techniques that are actually confocal based technique. What I will be telling you about is our systems, which are RCM and NL5 uh, plus uh, techniques, which are both confocal microscopy technique, but unlike others, these are rescan confocal uh, techniques, and they can either provide higher resolution, is the case of RCM, or the a higher speed in the case of NL5 plus, but at the same time, they're both work under very low laser power conditions. And the concept of the technology is when it's compared to the standard confocal microscopy as shown here, what you do see is a pinhole uh, 
uh, where which which serves as for the removal of out of focus blur. However, in the re RCM technique or in rescanning confocal technology, we remove the PMT and after the the pinhole, we put another uh, relay lens and then a rescanner and then it's directly uh, imaged on the uh, camera chip, meaning that we increase the quantum efficiency. Where you, with PMT, your quantum efficiency is in the range of thirty percent. With the the latest cameras that we are using, our quantum efficiency is 96%. Uh, this is how it looks like. So uh, not only that we at the same time increase the sensitivity of the detection compared to standard confocal, we also, in the case of RCM, increase the, the spot. And uh, later, we uh, based on that, we increase the resolution of 40% going in the realm of super resolution that is up to 120 nanometer resolution. So, uh, how what does it have an effect on directly on the on the cells on the imaging? We actually can with the rescanning confocal microscopy we can obtain brighter images with even with the dim signals uh, and even with the lower laser power just because of the fact we have a bigger pinhole allowing us to image and obtain better resolution than with the standard confocal with a smaller pinhole and. Here, this is shown in two videos that we have. So we currently offer two types of, uh, sorry, we offer two types of um, confocal microscopy. One is a point scanning confocal, similar to standard confocal point scanner, laser scanning confocal microscopes. And the other thing is a line rescanning confocal. In this case, with the line rescanner, we use instead of a pinhole, like a standard pinhole, we use a slit which allows us to, to image much faster and even in the video rate of 75 frames per second. So here are the, the shown just the presented how our microscopes look like. On the left hand side, again, point rescan confocal, speci uh, specialized in super resolution. On the right hand side is line range uh, rescan confocal, specialized in uh, imaging highly dynamic events within the cell. Uh, speaking of the first one, RCM, it's uh, uh, hallmarks are that it can uh, uh, image in super resolution, so up to 120 nanometers, using nanowatts of powers. At the same time, it is can be used as universal add-on to any wide field body, and uh, also it uses a 40x magnification objectives to obtain super resolution images. If you have been doing super resolution imaging, you know that the super resolution is suddenly done with 100x. However, with 40x, we obtain the same resolution at the same time obtaining a larger field of view. And here is another example how, thanks to this large field of view, one can actually image events over a longer period of time. Here is several thousands of fr frames. And then Upon that, one can actually choose different segments within this experiment to evaluate in, uh, or investigate in a greater detail. If someone, for example, wants to observe the signal of uh, transport along the cytoskeleton, one can observe it just selecting a number within those number, large number of frames and observe the events here in the case of uh, a retrograde transport uh, of the cargo. Just by knowing the, the parameters and the frame times, one can actually cal calculate the, the speed of the cargo. The same goes here for mitochondria when we are talking about mitochondrial trafficking. However, mitochondria is not just that. Mitochondria next to it, it being also the power, uh, power plant of the cell, uh, one of its hallmarks are the constant fusion and fission events. And one can observe when observing over a longer period of time inside of the cell, one can actually see those events and using this combination in combination with various mutants, for example, of mitofusions, one can go and pinpoint the exact mechanism of the event on the subcellular level. When we are talking uh, uh, last year, we have developed... Uh, 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 last year we have developed an LF5 line scan and rescanning confocal, and this year we have uh, released on foam and Elmi it's uh, the latest version. It's called NL5 Plus, which provides a high-speed imaging of 75 frames per second in a standard confocal resolution. 
And but this has proven to be an excellent tool to image organoids. So this is an organoid image in the depth of 280 micrometers. Our latest imaging has shown that we are actually limited by the working distance of the objective. So the microscope itself can provide imaging as deep as possible. Uh, another thing that we use next to organoids, which are perfect model for studying cancer, for example, or different types of diseases, we use it in embryology. Here is the image of 140 micrometer depth image of the mouse embryo. Next to it, there is a number more of uh, the applications we use it. Next to organoids, we are also um, it is also used in embryology, like on the upper right side, you observing zebrafish development next to organoids. And also we can observe very fast events. Here, what you do see is this calcium release in the root of Arabidopsis thaliana. So before I move to, uh, we move to, to, to Erwin and his work in, uh, in protein biology and imaging, I want to just leave you with this take home message. What we do is we have a unique combination of the rescan confocal technology, open pinhole to attract because we collect more lights than a standard confocal microscope. And in combination with camera based detection of high quantum efficiency, we can provide deepest and gentlest imaging conditions among the confocals. It's only thing upon the, the researchers to choose whether they want to go deeper into the subcellular level and chase for super resolution, or they are going to observe um, organoids or different uh, model system for that require fast imaging of the dynamic events. So thank you very much. And I would like now to give uh, the floor to Erwin Petermann, full professor at Fry University Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you, Dusan. Uh, uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Then I can, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Here we are. I hope you can see it. Yes. Then let's get started. So I would like to tell you something about uh, uh, the research we have been doing in the lab over the past years. Uh, on uh, in vivo imaging in C. elegans, focusing on the chemosensory cilia. Uh, and I will end, most of the imaging was done with uh, wide field imaging, but we run into some limitations. We ran into some limitations and I will explain that to you. And uh, we recently uh, uh, got uh, NL5 plus, and I will show you some of the first images uh, we have uh, taken with that at the end. Okay, we are interested in uh, understanding how animals sense uh, what is going on in their environment. And as many of you with a biology background know, almost all eukaryotic cells have uh, a cilium, which you can uh, uh, see as the, the antenna of the cell. And the cilium is basically a couple of micrometer long extension of, uh, uh, of the cell that really is involved in sensing all sort of uh, uh, information in the environment. The model system we use to study uh, chemosensory or sensory cilia is uh, C. elegans, shown here. Why do we do that? Because C. elegans is easy for us to, uh, uh, relatively easy for us to, to grow and maintain and to also manipulate to make it fluorescent. Uh, but the major advantage of C. elegans is that uh, uh, it is transparent, so it's really amenable to high-resolution uh, uh, imaging. And uh, uh, yeah, I, there is no scale bar here, but uh, for people who do not know, C. elegans is about a millimeter uh, long and uh, 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 about 100 micrometer in uh, diameter. Okay, um, C. elegans... Not all cells in C. elegans are ciliated, but uh, uh, some of its neurons are. It has 302 neurons. Each animal has exactly 302 neurons. And of these, about 50 or 60 are uh, uh, ciliated and are involved in sensing the environment. We focus on the chemosensory cilia, and there's basically two bunches, uh, uh, a couple called the amphid cilia, around the mouth, and I will come back to that later, uh, but we mostly focus on 
the cilia in the, in the tail of the, of the worm where there is two pairs of so-called vesmid uh, cilia. Uh, and these cilia have a, a, a very big, uh, interesting uh, structure, namely that they are basically extensions of the cell membrane uh, uh, and the core of the cilium is really uh, an, a so-called exoneme, a bundle of microtubules. Uh, so they are really only a couple of hundred nanometers in diameter. And in, in uh, uh, C. elegans, there are eight micrometers long. What is important to note is that in C. elegans, the cilia we study are extensions of the dendrite. So not of the, of the, of the soma of the cell, but of the dendrite of this nuance. And uh, what is really interesting about, about almost all cilia is that there is this so-called transition zone in which uh, multiple proteins connect the microtubules to the membrane and form a meshwork that really uh, segregates from uh, the, 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 the proteins that are in the cilium from the ones that are outside of the cilium. And not only the, the, the cytoplasm and cilioplasm, but also the membranes. The membrane compositions are really completely different. And that is really an essential uh, hallmark of cilia. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit more uh, in these uh, C. elegans chemosensor cilia, they're bipartite in the sense that they have a region where the microtubules are so-called doublets, uh, uh, which we call the proximal segment. So here is the base, here is the transition zone. Uh, and this part, this first half, sort of four or five micrometers is the proximal segment. And uh, uh, extending from that are microtubule signets, uh, uh, and that's formed the distal segment. And in, in the CDI we look at, it's only the tip that is in contact with the outside world. So that needs to sense, uh, uh, their stuff needs to be sensed what is going on. And one of the amazing things, and that's why we got into cilia in the first place, is that there is this sort of conveyor belt, continuous transport mechanism going on in the cilia uh, uh, that, that transports stuff in the membranes, but also just components that build the cilia. Uh, and it, uh, it transports stuff from base to tip and, and tip to base and uh, it goes on and on and on. And in C. elegans, in the C. elegans chemosensory cilia, it's three motor proteins that drive this transport. Two kinesins, kinesin 2 and ozon 3, that take transport, care of the transport from base to tip, and IFT dynein that takes care of the transport in the other direction. And the amazing thing of this transport mechanism, which is widely conserved uh, over all uh, animal, uh, animals, uh, is that it uh, sort of uh, is not vesicle based as dendritic or axonemal transport, uh, but it is based on so called trains, protein trains. So it consists of these multiple copies, hundreds of copies of these IFT proteins, which are basically, yeah, I always envision it as, as uh, you have a cargo train where there is the, 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 the engines, uh, the motor proteins, but there is these uh, uh, carts. Uh, in which the cargo to which is loaded, uh, and that you could envision the IFT proteins uh, like that. What happens is that at the base, these trains assemble, and uh, um, uh, it's mostly that, at least that was what was uh, a thought, kinesin 2, uh, uh, a heterotromeric uh, motor protein that drives the transport into the proximal segment. Then for some reason, uh, kinesin 2 was believed to uh, leave the trains, and I show here basically two uh, of these protein complexes, IFTA and IFTB, but in reality it's uh, hundreds of them or so that are connected. And then sort of at this point, uh, um, uh, OSM3 takes over, was believed to take over, and is necessary to uh, drive transport to the ciliary tip. There magic happens, and IFT dynein uh, takes over and transports all the stuff back again while picking up uh, the motor proteins and delivering them back. Now, we had many questions how this cooperation of these motor proteins, how that actually works, uh, and uh, also how this is connected to the function of these uh, 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 cilia. So IFT is absolutely required for building maintenance and functioning of the cilia, and I will address two 
things that we have been studying over the past years. One is motor cooperation. How do these two kinesins cooperate and why do we need to? And uh, a question we have uh, started to ask uh, uh, relatively recently, are IFT and ciliary function connected? So what is our approach? What has been approached basically up to now is to really use endogenous expression of fluorescent proteins uh, in presently tagged proteins in the worms. So originally using a so-called MOSCI protocol, but uh, more recently we're uh, switching, of course, also to CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and that makes it, in fact, we are often studying only uh, in the whole cilium uh, a couple of hundred proteins at a time. So fluorescence levels are generally pretty low, but we can manage. We have so far been using, uh, uh, focusing on the cilia in the tail of the worm, mostly epifluorescence microscopy. And that works, as I will show you, pretty good for this particular application. But there is a cost you, uh, you pay, and I will come back to that later. And uh, Confocal, of course, Confocal and Confocal.nl come to the rescue, I hope. Uh, and we also invested enormous amounts of effort and time in data analysis, uh, in quantitative data analysis. We really see fluorescence microscopy not as a means of making beautiful images, but as a quantitative uh, method to really get into the numbers of uh, what is going on. That's what we said. So we use uh, 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 automatic chymograph analysis. And what I will show you later, we also can do by using photo bleaching, we can go to the single molecule regime and track individual uh, motors and other proteins and really get a lot of information from that. Okay, so once you have made a worm, you throw it in your microscope, what is it what you see? Here you see an example of one of these trained proteins that is labeled IFTB, one of the IFTB proteins, and this is what you see, scale bar, uh, of, I guess, uh, uh, one micrometer. This is the base. This is the tip. Basically, it's two cilia that are coming together and coming too close for us to, to resolve. And this is, again, natural expression levels of this IFTB protein. And you basically see that stuff is moving, but it's a bit of a hazy cloud. And that is not because of our image, that our image is not sharp enough, but it's just a little bit too busy uh, to really see uh, what's going on. So what we have been doing is we have made chymographs time uh, space plots. So what you see here is the uh, fluorescence intensity plotted as a function of time, so of the image and of uh, uh, position along the cilium. So we really project the data on one axis, which is the ciliary axis. And we have uh, we play some tricks with uh, Fourier uh, filtering such that we can color transport from base to tip uh, here in green. We call that anthrograde transport and transport back in, in red. Uh, it's measured with the same dye. Uh, it's really just a trick in the image analysis. And these are the trajectories we get. And we can do a lot with this because here you can sort of separate different lines. We can uh, extract them from the chymographs and we can do all sorts of measurements on them. For example, what is shown here, the average velocity averaged over many, many of these trains uh, as a function of position. And we see that in the beginning, the velocity is a bit is lower. And then after one and a half micrometer, it really starts to increase, reaching sort of the maximum of 1.2, 1.4 uh, micrometers per, sec uh, per second. And you can also see that directly in the chymograph. In the beginning, the slope is a bit steeper and it later on uh, falls off. And so what you see is that these trains, they start moving slowly and then they accelerate and the intensity more or less seems to stay in contact, uh, constant, uh, constant. We can also measure that. So next what we did is we looked at the two kinesin motor proteins. And here you see uh, the, the color here is really two different fluorophores because this is a strain we made where we have uh, the two kinesins, kinesin 2 and ozone 3, labeled with different colors. And you see, uh, yeah, very beautifully that these sort of the, the, the a single line in a, in, a, in a chymograph turns from almost completely green 
gradually here uh, magenta and in the end it's only magenta so if we average that over many worms many cilia many tracks in these cilia uh, we can uh, get the average intensity profiles and we can calibrate this uh, uh, and determine uh, what the fluorescence intensity tells us how many motors uh, are connected to one train and what we see is that a train takes off with about 50 pennies and twos at about 10 or some threes and then uh, after leaving the transition zone, the Canesian 2 starts to fall off within a few micrometers, uh, while ozone 3, uh, uh, the number of ozone 3 start to increase, reaching a maximum of about 40 uh, per train. So what, what, what this shows is that Canesian 2 gradually hands over IFT cargo to ozone 3. But the question is, of course, what is the underlying mechanism uh, what is going on? And the only way, I mean, I come from the Murner lab, so single molecule is a must. Uh, and I think it really uh, helped us to really unravel what is going on. Um, uh, so what we used, we used some tricks. We either use photoactivation with photoactivatable GFP proteins. Uh, but in most cases, in fact, we use photobleaching. We are dealing with relatively small numbers of proteins. So just photobleaching, 90 95%, we're already at the single molecule level, and we can track individual motors. And I show you a few images here. And I mean, these images are not are noisy, not super beautiful, but if you process them with the right software, you can track, track individual uh, proteins. And that's shown here, these red circles are uh, tracked uh, by uh, uh, tracking software, and we can get uh, individual trajectories out. And these two that are highlighted here, are in my view already really, really interesting because we show here that the Kinesin 2 motor makes a U-turn. In principle, this Kinesin 2 can only walk from base to tip, so from here to there, but apparently these motors can turn around and uh, 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 move backwards. What we think is happening, I will show you later on that that is indeed the case, is that they fall off a train diffuse around a little bit and the train moving in the other direction passes by and they bind again and they are transported uh, back driven by IFT dyne. For the other motor, Ozone 3, we see something uh, similar. But of course, over a much uh, uh, longer length of the, of the cilia. So we can extract these uh, trajectories and we can uh, uh, do all sort of analysis. And I show just an example here. But where we looked at the locations of these turnaround events, where the direction of the motors changes, and we can uh, pinpoint where these take place in the cilia. And basically, what we see is that Canesian 2 really cycles from base up to a few micrometers uh, within the cilium, while ozone 3 really cycles over the whole length of, uh, of, the, of the cilia. Of course, we, what we really wanted to know is what happens during this uh, turnaround, this driver to passenger switch. So what we did is we developed tools. We wanted to do two color uh, uh, single molecule imaging, but that never really worked because we use a stochastic way of photo bleaching molecules so that you then have two single molecules on one train. It of course never ever happens. So what we did Instead, is that we did two color imaging with one color at the single molecule level and the other color just at the multi, at the bulk level. Uh, so we uh, look at single trains at the single molecule level, in this case with CAP1 and Cherry. And we look at trains at the multi molecule level, in this case by using the IFT, the dynein as a label. And these are some images, it's maybe a little bit complicated. So what you see here is a single molecule trajectory of this cap one in white, uh, zoomed in here. And in the background, you see uh, trains. So basically all trains labeled by IFT dynein uh, moving forward and backward. And this again is this uh, uh, color, uh, color scheme uh, where we use anthrograde forward moving towards the tip in red and retrograde to the back. And what you basically see in this example is that uh, the forward mo motion indeed overlaps with the train. The, uh, the forward motion of this Cap1 MG uh, and Cherry overlaps 
uh, with a forward moving train while the uh, after the turnaround it moves in the opposite direction and there it overlaps with the train that is moving in the retrograde direction we could do all sort of uh, uh, analysis on that. We used, for example, this, the Manders coefficient, uh, named after Eric Manders, the founder of Confocal, uh, uh, .nl, uh, to indeed show that there is this absolute correlation between uh, the, the motion of an individual motor protein and the motion of whole trains. So what this shows us is that Carnesian 2 is almost always attached uh, to a train when it's moving in the anterograde director direction it's a driver and then when it's moving in the retrograde it is a, a passenger uh, we also did some experiments with higher time resolution i don't have the time to show you but there we showed that during this turnaround in fact there is a short moment that the motor is diffusing around so what happens the motor is moving uh, attached to a train in a directed way it falls off the train, it diffuses around until it meets another train, and then it's transported back again. Good. So this uh, uh, gives us a little bit of an idea of what, how we think that IFT and C. elegans and uh, possibly also in many other organisms works. We have these trains that are transported mostly by kinase and two uh, in the beginning of the cilium, but then we get this gradual handover from kinase and two to OSM3. OSM3 really takes care of the transport in the, in the distal segment towards the tip. There magic happens and uh, IFT dynein is activated and IFT dynein takes trains back and takes uh, um, also the Canesian motor proteins back. And this results uh, uh, in a sort of uh, distribution of the concentrations that we in fact also observe uh, uh, in reality. And what is important here is that the, it, what it looks like is that the backbones, the train backbone moves in one go from base to tip and from tip to base again, but it's really the motors that dock on and off and determine velocity and directionality. Okay, I wanted to tell something else and I hope I will manage. And that is, does IFT respond to the sensing by cilia? Uh, why is this? This vestment cilia, they contain the sensory machinery for chemo repulsion. Example here, we pipette uh, something, I don't know, the worm doesn't like on its face. And what you see is that the worm turns around and make this now this beautiful so-called omega turn here. So elegant. Uh, uh, so it really reacts on, on, uh, on chemicals you supply to it. Uh, how does it do that? It does that by, via neuronal activity. So what we did is we tried to really uh, image this in a, in a nice way. We made a microfluidic ship where we can uh, accurately uh, uh, dose and time uh, uh, different uh, chemicals. And we looked at the response uh, to some typical uh, uh, um, reagents. So we used hyperosmotic stimuli, and here I show glycerol, where we get, and what you see here is the calcium response of the particular cell of the Vesmid cells. And you see that we give a stimulus of about uh, 40 seconds. What we get is we get high calcium fluorescence, high fluorescence of the calcium sensor, which means higher calcium concentration. And that stops uh, after we release uh, the, st the chemical stimulus. And uh, in uh, case of SDS or other chemical stimuli, for example, copper, we see a slightly different signal. In the average, it's, it doesn't look so different. Uh, uh, but if you look at individual trajectories, you see that in most cases, we get a pretty sharp single peak. But in some of the cases, we get a secondary uh, 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 short peak. So that uh, looks in this tailed uh, structure. So the response to these different stimuli is different. What we next asked is whether uh, IFT also reacts to these different stimuli. I, I, again, I said that calcium signaling is how, uh, that sets the whole uh, movement of the worm into motion. Uh, sorry, the, the calcium spikes in the neurons, that's what sets the motion of the worm in motion. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, does IFT respond as well? 
And you see the answer here. So this is a worm that expresses again these two kinesian motors uh, um, in, um, uh, in different colors. And what you see is really a massive uh, uh, redistribution of both motor proteins when we apply the stimulus. Uh, I think the stimulus is now on, and you see accumulation of both kinesins at the tip up here. And then when the stimulus goes, you get a wave back. So what's going on? We did a lot of analysis with uh, uh, chymographs and different components, kinesin 2, ozone 3, IFT dynein, IFTB. Uh, and basically what we see it, for all these components is that they accumulate at the tip. Uh, kinesin 2, which is normally restricted really to the first few micrometers of the cilium, uh, starts moving towards the end of this, uh, towards the ciliary tip. Uh, amazing. Um, and our, uh, if we end the stimulus, we get a very fast uh, recovery of stuff moving back to the base. Uh, uh, and we get similar results for glycerol or for high salt. So this really seems to be the hyperosmotic uh, response. What, uh, yeah, we asked the question, does this have any effect on the ciliary on ciliary structure? And basically, the answer is no. So here we look at TBB4, tubulin, which stains the exoneme. And you see before stimulus, after stimulus. Here you see a chymograph. Basically, nothing happens. Uh, we also looked at OCR2, which is a membrane protein that we have shown before, we had shown before, accumulates at the ciliary tip. And in fact, we see that it increases a little bit the uh, accumulation of this protein at the tip. Uh, and this is recovered to some extent after uh, we stop uh, providing the stimulus. Mm -hmm. So overall, no big changes in ciliary structure. So what happens for these other chemicals? So we use, for example, SDS, and here you see some chymographs. Uh, in fact, what we saw is that for these chemical repellents, as we call them, SDS or copper, the, we, we see much more vari variability in time scale and stuff uh, 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 of the reaction. But what we see is completely the opposite of uh, uh, what we have shown before. We see, namely, that IF the IFT machinery uh, uh, accumulates towards the ciliary base. Here you see that it, after a few seconds, stuff gets away from the cilium and really accumulates at the base. In some cases here, we see the same for ozone three, but also part of the motor proteins stay, stay behind. And we see the same for IFT dynein and IFTB. So stuff is transported back to the base. Uh, redistribution often takes place in steps. First, uh, from the distal tip uh, 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 to the proximal segment, and in some cases, uh, really back to the base. Similar uh, response for copper and SDS. We also asked our, uh, ourselves the question, uh, uh, yeah, but what happens to ciliary structure? And here we saw, uh, uh, we got a great surprise because if we looked at TBB4, we really see that TBB4 is depleted from the distal part of the cilium. So the uh, ciliary structure is really affected the exoneme uh, collapses. For OCR2, this membrane protein, the, the image is a little bit less clear. Let me come back to that a little bit later. Uh, for copper, we saw the same thing. Uh, uh, we saw that this, uh, the distal segment uh, disappears when we apply copper. But we also saw we could, for some reason, we obtained uh, 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 experiments we could image for very long about an hour, and we could see that on the time scale of about an hour, that this uh, uh, exoneme regrows again, and that the structure becomes uh, uh, sort of normal again. Yeah? You see here the cilium extending to the full length, comparable to what we had at T is zero. So what is this all good for? Um, yeah, we wondered, maybe this has an effect on neuronal activity, and indeed, if we give repeated SDS stimuli, so here we give an SDS stimulus, then we pause for a while and we give a next one. Uh, so here, this is long enough 
uh, to be sure that uh, the psyllium uh, is affected, we really see that there is, in most cases, no response to the second uh, stimulus. Uh, for copper, we see exactly the same. So we wondered whether this could be some sort of uh, a switching off of the uh, ciliary uh, neuronal uh, activity. So, so some sort of uh, habituation like uh, uh, aspect. In fact, to really show that this is the case, we again waited for about an hour to see if the signal would recover. And in, in, in fact, it does recover after uh, on the timescale of about an hour. Uh, for glycerol, the situation is different. There, if we give repeated stimuli, uh, the psyllium remains active. So no uh, uh, habituation there as expected because the ciliary structure is still intact. Okay. Um, yeah, one last question we asked, what happens to the membrane? And I showed you some OCR2 imaging. We couldn't really see what's happening there. So we looked at uh, uh, some other proteins. And here in this movie, you really see very clearly what happens is that stuff is excreted. Here you see it, you see little blobs Bloop, 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 uh, disappear like a tube of, uh, how to call it, toothpaste uh, uh, squeezed out. Uh, so we looked at some more uh, components. And here we, we give some uh, inverse color images. And you really see that we see this extracellular vesicle formation. We see that not only for OSM3, we also see it for Xbox One for, and for the other. Uh, IFT components. We also looked at membrane proteins and in effect for OCR2, we see that that is also excreted in these extracellular vesicles. Uh, we looked at TSP6, tetraspanin 6, which is a protein that people have implement, uh, have, uh, uh, it, it has been labeled before as a marker for extracellular vesicles. It's a protein that seems to, membrane protein that seems to like uh, highly curved uh, membrane areas, and it's highly enriched in the in the cilium. Uh, yeah, it really almost shows that the membrane fragments into uh, small blobs, some of which are excreted. Okay, let me wrap up what I have shown here. So we, I've shown you that these neurons respond in a different way to to the stimuli, uh, hyperosmotic stimuli. We get accumulation of the components at the tip, but the cilium still remains intact and uh, active. Uh, while these chemo chemical stimuli, we get different uh, neuronal response. We see shrinkage of the axoneme, and uh, we see this shedding of the membrane, and we might have something to do with uh, uh, switching off the sensory function of the cilium. So what is next? And that's where confocal.nl comes in. Uh, the worm has many camera sensory organs. Four of them are located in the tail. Those are the ones we have studied so far. But in fact, the ones in the head of the worm, and there are sort of 20 of them, uh, are a bit more interesting because they're also for attractive uh, chemosensing. And the biology is a little bit better understood there. So we really would like to image there, but we cannot because it's a really sort of three-dimensional pyramidal structure that is not uh, possible to be imaged with uh, our wide field techniques. We also want to look deeper into the whole uh, neuron uh, to look better at the soma and at the dendrite and the, maybe even the axon. That's also deeper in the worm. It's not in one plane anymore, so we cannot use uh, uh, wide field imaging anymore. Yeah, it's really, Epi Whitefield is cool if you only have fluorescence within a, how to call it, half a micrometer or so of, of your sample. And that is what we have in the cilia, but not elsewhere. Uh, we were lucky enough to have that in the cilia. So we really need a method for these things to, uh, uh, yeah, with better uh, out-of-focus background suppression. And uh, for that, uh, we recently purchased uh, a fluorescent system. Of course, you need a fast uh, and a very highly sensitive system. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, purchased the uh, NL5 Plus. Uh, and I will just show you a few images very early on. So this is the instrument in our lab. Beautiful orange box. 
Uh, and uh, uh, these are some first images. So this is a, a maximum projection of all the neural, neuronal somas in the head of the worm. And you see that it's a whole zoo. This is the brain, the CPU of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the worm. Um, uh, and we now can image it and we can see all the cells. And that's really cool. Uh, and uh, discriminate them. And I want to show one movie. So this is a cilium base tip, but now we have the whole neuron, at least no, not the axon, but the dendrite and the cell body in focus. Uh, and we can image it for a very long time. This The movie, what you see here is about half an hour. And we are looking at transport of one of the proteins we're interested in, TSP6. And we can follow it and you see there's hardly any photo bleaching. So we're really super excited about that. This is a common graph of the motion and you see a lot of stuff happening, st stuff being stuck, stuff being mo uh, moving for uh, certain amounts of time. And we are really looking uh, into this right now and uh, very excited about it. Okay, let me wrap up. I'm running over time. Uh, I would like to thank the people who did the, the motor work, Bram, Pierre, Felix, and Andy, mostly. Uh, Christina and Kikus did the microfluidics work. Of course, I should thank the rest of my lab who did many other cool stuff. Uh, strains we get from CGC and uh, from some uh, other collaborators. And NVO and ERC have uh, paid the bills. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, very much for this talk. Uh, actually, I have to say that not only uh, I was amazed by the results, but uh, I think it was really wrapped to fit the audience. I think it was wonderful. So uh, thank you again for really both of you. Uh, now uh, that we have uh, approximately uh, 10 minutes left, um, if people in the audience uh, would like to ask question, so either you raise your hand or you can type your question uh, within the chat. Uh, if you raise your hand, remind that uh, if you do not want your face to appear on the video on YouTube later on, do not forget to turn off your video. Uh, and uh, I think uh, both our speakers uh, would be happy to take questions if you have some. Don't be shy. <laughs> so maybe I can I can start with uh, with the question for Ervin. So you said that on the first part when you 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 would like to to see the um, individual molecules, uh, the motors, you prefer to do by FRAP than by photo activation or photo conversion. Can you maybe comment this? Yeah. So. I, I should say in for our in our case that has worked uh, generally better uh, and that's for several reasons. Uh, um, one reason is that uh, EGFP is a better fluorophore than P, than than PAGFP we used, so that more, more every photon counts. So that is important. We had uh, we have tried them there. We, we never really got it optimally working. Um, so we, we have mostly focused on, on photo activatable GFP. And there we sort of had the problem that if you use 488 or 491 nanometer for photo bleaching or for activation for photo bleaching or for just detection, uh, you activate it with that uh, as well. So it is really finicky to, to get into the right excitation regime to to get enough uh, fluorophores being excited and uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, have enough uh, fluorescent signal. Uh, so, and that is just easier with uh, photo bleaching is in, in our uh, hands for this particular system. Yeah. Okay. And it's not toxic for the, for the worm when you, when you bleach like this or. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we thought it was not, but we, it, yeah, you have to be careful. So the in fact the, the worm, and it's not a, a, a completely understood how it works, but the worm detects blue and UV light, and it sometimes also reacts on that. Uh, so we have to 
keep that to a limit. But I mean, I should imagine that uh, it's important to realize that the intensities we use to do single molecule imaging are already very high. I mean, the the the, the photo bleaching is only a little bit uh, uh, extra. So the the single molecule imaging itself uh, might already be uh, 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 causing some effects. So we really have to uh, make sure that that is uh, okay and uh, works fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I, I may have questions as well. <laughs> so uh, both, uh, some some of them related more on the biological mechanisms uh, and some others maybe on the more on the technological side. Uh, so at first, I, I, so it it's actually, uh, it was very unknown for me to, to know that the, the, the motors and the, the, the cargo, everything can reverse in order to move back and so, um, but you were very elusive uh, in the mechanism of the reversing. So they detach, then they they diffuse, and they reattach. But by chance, on the, the other way around. Yeah. Do you have any idea of that? How that could happen? Are no. there any sort of chaperone or wrapping molecules that uh, favor that uh, movement? Or so work. But it's, uh, 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 yeah, uh, if. Uh, how to call it? I wanted to tell too many things, so <laughs> I, 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 sorry for missing some of the details. No, no, go on. Yeah. Very important to realize is that so the the say the direction is set in a way by the microtubules. They're all pointed with their plus end outward. Uh, the kinesins only move from minus end to plus end. The dynines only from plus end to minus end. Um, what we think is going on is that the when as soon as the motors detach and that's the same for dynein as uh, uh, definitely for the kinesins as soon as they detach they go into an inactivated form and cannot bind to the microtubules ah, okay uh, only binding to cargo can uh, result in their activation that is that there is quite a body of evidence for, uh, for that for many uh, different kinesins also for these so what so what we think is really that this binding affinity is subtly organized and that might be location dependent it mm -hmm. might be different for anterograde moving trains to retrograde moving trains most likely uh, but the details we do not really understand but it's uh, uh, we are really we're sure that we only get a uh, 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 directed transport either as cargo of a retrograde moving train or as driver of an anterograde moving train uh, when the motors are bound to uh, a train. But is there any modification of the of the protein like phosphorylation or this kind of thing so? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, people have uh, uh, investigated, and we are also investigating these kind of things. We have not really been able to pinpoint uh, a phosphorylation and post uh, translation modification definitely play a role, but it is not. It's not a simple story that this switch on and off uh, takes care of all the transport. So there is now an amazing body of electron microscopy data uh, appearing uh, where people in situ, not in C. elegans, but in, in chlamydomonas, can really image at, what is it, angstrom resolution, uh, few angstrom resolution, uh, um, whole trains. Uh, and uh, really the idea is that the, the, the structure of trains moving forward and backward is really different. Uh, we know very uh, the how to call it the structure of trains moving in the forward direction is now well understood. The structure of, of trains moving in the opposite direction is not yet uh, clear, but I guess that uh, that will be a matter of time. Uh, and how that is orchestrated, that's not yet clear. But uh, uh, it, it, it it could also very well be that it's really the the train that uh, sets uh, uh, many of the aspects uh, uh, that define how the motors bind 
and uh, if they can be active in that uh, uh, that way. Do I have time for one question, Gael and Virginie? Sure. Uh, I, think, I think we can, yes. Uh, Erin, one thing, this whole concept looks so tightly regulated and nuanced. So did you try to manipulate the levels of kinesin and dianine? Yeah. Just lifting one up, lowering one down and see what's going on with the transfer, because I, I guess you would get very weird results depending on what you do, right? Uh, we have been trying that. We never really succeeded, but... Uh, how to call it? We're working on it. I just wrote a grant, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So this is really the, the uh, so this is a very a great remark. This is exactly what you would want to do to sort of reduce the number of proteins. So almost, there, of course, a lot of stuff is being done on, 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 on mutants where really the function of one of the motors is completely uh, lacking. And that gives interesting insight. Uh, but in many cases, these worms are a little bit sick. So sometimes you see accumulations. It's basically uh, then you have sort of a train accident. You want to see the train accident happening, not the, uh, 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 how do you call it, the, the, wreck, the train wreck at the end. Uh, that is what we want to do. And that is exactly a way uh, we, we would like to figure it out. But we haven't been able to do it so far. Thank you. Well, I may have one last question uh, related to both of you. So, uh, Erwin, you were telling us in the very end that actually the, the, the new system could enable you not only to increase uh, the, the duration for which you can image the, the, your, the process happening, but also the field of view. And I was actually uh, uh, wondering if you can estimate uh, what is this improvement in terms of not only yes time, but as well, uh, how many times more have you been able to increase the field of view? For example, what was the actually the, the objective that you were using before and the related field of view and now the one that you are act, uh, usually uh, uh, actually uh, using now? And uh, if you can have an idea of all the expectations in terms of improvement in both space and time that are um, so so we typically use different objectives for different applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the the, the I, I would say the big difference in this case is not so much the objective; it's it's the it's the camera. Ah yes. Uh, so uh, the 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 how to call it we for the for all the wide field experiments we we use an EMC CD mm -hmm. camera with 512 by 512 and big uh, 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 pixels, but of course for the for the the line scan we use uh, what is it an uh, CMOS mm -hmm. small pixels and many more of them. Uh, yeah, uh, look, we are, uh, of course, li uh, limited or restricted by the size of the animal. <laughs> uh, um, so I would say, le le let me come back to what you said. So the um, I, I think what what I think is that so sort of with the, with the confocal system, we will not be able to do, or I'm pretty sure we will not be able to do single molecule imaging. Mm -hmm. But for all the other things, it might uh, uh, really work well. Uh, and uh, um, the, 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 our single molecule imaging, we really sort of, we are lucky to work on a system that is almost one or two dimensional, if you would want to say. And that really, uh, 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 that's why uh, um, um, wide field imaging works in that case. Otherwise, confocal will always be better. And uh, so that's what we hope to do to also really get three-dimensional uh, information and uh, uh, these kind of things. And, and then, I mean, the image I showed you uh, shows really that the, what, what uh, Dusan was telling, uh, it, the, the confocal instrument, this confocal instrument is very good in measuring every photon. So... <laughs> Uh, reducing photo bleaching a lot. And I think for live imaging, uh, yeah, uh, that is so important. Okay, great. Um, 
We just had uh, a question actually in the chat from uh, Chloe. Uh, so it's in French, so I will translate it. I think it's more dedicated to do Sam. Uh, yeah. So Chloe is asking uh, how the confocal.nl system does improve the resolution up to uh, 120 nanometer in X and Y. So she said that she understood that you do that by increasing the size of the pinhole and uh, in, the, in turn that you can diminish the laser power. Uh, and so by, uh, I, I think she's confused that by how increasing the size of the pinhole, you still diminish the resolution. I think uh, I have translated it more or less. So, uh, okay, I'll try to do it in, in as short as possible time because I was warned by you. <laughs> so these the two the separate things. So what we do uh, based on the scanning and rescanning system in the in the animation I have shown you, I have shown you that we are literally stretching, stretching the spot. And then by reducing the image, we actually improve the resolution. The improvement of resolution through the rescanning on focal microscopy system, RCM system, is only for RCM, not for NL5+. Plus. In RCM, it goes for 40%. So in theory, raw resolution increase is 170 nanometers. We also have within our system, with our RCM system plugin, we also um, have a deconvolution software with this microvolution that further reduces the resolution, actually reduces, improves the resolution from 170 to 120 nanometers. Uh, microvolution is one of the options because it provides deconvolution on the fly. So you can do the live cell images to do the live cell super resolution. We also can do deconvolution through SVI hyphens. Uh, which uses a different type of uh, mathematical operations, but this is happening in post-processing. For live cell super resolution, 120 nanometers, the combination is RCM2 or RCM2.5 together with microvolution. Uh, is this okay as an answer? <laughs> uh, I think it is. Then it's on Chloe to, yes, she said yes. <laughs> um. So I don't know, Virginie, maybe we can, I think if you have an all. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think it's it time to close and to thank uh, Dushan and Erving. Thank uh, you. And yeah. thanks to confocal.nl to, to, to have proposed this, uh, this meeting and, uh, and these speakers. So thanks a lot. Indeed. Thank you a lot. Thank you to the audience as well. Probably yes. Attending this talk. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Bye. And the next meeting, uh, the next video conference will be uh, the fifth of September. So we do a break for in uh, August. So next meeting, the fifth of September, and it will be with Andor uh, Company. So thanks a lot to you all, and uh, have a nice summer. <laughs> Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye.